we'll probably start and do a few more of these webinars in the autumn. And if there's any topics that you feel would be really particularly useful for you in your ministry, in renewing things in your church life and church mission, in engaging with children and young people in new ways, do let us know um, any topics that you might like to explore through this medium of doing these online webinars. That would be great. I'm Isabel. I'm with the Church of Scotland. I'm a children's development worker. And so I'm hosting these webinars. So um, it's lovely to see some old friends and some new faces as well. After the webinar, we will send you a follow-up email with some further resources and some of the information that Jill's going to be talking about and um, the, the link for the uh, recording of this webinar and all the others. So just as we start, let me just open us with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of grandparents, a gift for our families, for the families of others, and a gift for our church. Thank you for all the love, the experience, and the faith that they have and that they can share. We pray that you be with us as we explore this area in this webinar tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to welcome uh, Jill Live, uh, who's going to be leading us in this webinar this evening. And Jill works for Care for the Family in Scotland and has been quite involved with this particular area, but also with a whole load of other things about parenting, about supporting children and families um, in a whole variety of different ways. So, um, and Care for the Family produce lots of very, very useful, very uh, practical resources that can really help and that churches uh, across Scotland and the rest of the UK have been getting hold of and using to really help in developing their kind of engagement with children and their family ministry. Jill, thank you so much for coming and for guiding and leading us in this area. And we just look forward to kind of uh, digging in and thinking about some of these areas you're going to lead us in. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Getting some nods, great. Well, um, yes, as uh, Isabel mentioned, I work for Care for the Family uh, now, but it's taken me quite a long time to get to the point of working for Care for the Family here in Scotland. I've had lots of jobs along the way. So I thought I'd just give you a little introduction to myself to give a little idea of uh, my background and the different jobs that I have had along the way. I have been a library book stacker, a tour guide, an event organizer, a receptionist, a waitress, a youth worker, a shop assistant, a caterer, an administrator, a party entertainer, a chocolatier, you can ask me later at the question time, and now this. Um, but I'm very, very glad to have got where I am, although obviously my last job made me very popular with my kids and their friends. So I'm married to Stan, we live here in Dunfermline, and we have two kids, Joel, who is 15, and Hope, who actually turns 13 next Monday. And um, if my son's um, history is anything to go by, I think quite a lot is going to change next Monday as she is entering the teenage years. So we've got that to look forward to. Um, the only problem that I had, obviously, um, with being a chocolatier was around Easter time and they got very fancy chocolate and that has carried on. And so I, I don't get away with a pound land egg for them anymore. I have to spend a bit of money on a on a posh egg. But um, yeah, we're based here in Dunfermline. We've lived here for about 11 years now. Um, my husband is associate pastor at our church and, um, and it's just a real treat to be able to join you this evening and share on this really important topic of grandparenting and faith. And you know, you might be here this evening as someone who wants to find out more about grandparenting and faith. Perhaps you're wanting to support the grandparents that you know, or perhaps you are a grandparent, or maybe you're all three, maybe you're all of the above. And whatever situation you're in, I just hope that this evening will be a real encouragement 
in the very unique and special role that grandparents can play in their grandchildren's faith journeys. And whenever I have the opportunity to speak to grandparents, I usually share with them a lovely piece of writing that Rob Parsons, who's the founder of Care for the Family, has printed in his book here, um, The 60 Minute Grandparent, Becoming the Best Grandparent You Can Be. And uh, so let me read you now the job description for a grandparent. Lifetime position with responsibility for grandchildren from birth to beyond maturity. To work under supervision of directors of family-oriented organisation that may or may not be expecting expansion. Higher education not required. Previous experience as a paediatrician and a psychologist, however, is most helpful. Computer experience not necessary. In five years time, ch grandchild will provide training. Skill in reading aloud, essential. Successful applicants may have multiple duties and functions as required. Caregiver, nurturer, playmate, teacher, spiritual guide, cheerleader. Individual must be loving, caring, loving, selfless, loving, accepting, and of course, loving. Salary, seven figures, zero, 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 zero annually. Fringe benefits include overnight accommodation in addition to generous amounts of hugs and kisses. I spent a lovely time about six or seven years ago uh, going round the guilds from the Church of Scotland. We had been chosen um, as one of your uh, one of the fundraisers for the guild. I wonder is anybody here part of a guild in the Church of Scotland? When you raise your hand, I see a wave or two there. Wonderful. So it was a really good experience for me because. A lot of the people who go to guilds tend to be of the older generation. And I had an amazing time speaking to literally hundreds of people who were grandparents, hearing their stories of what it's like to really want to pass on faith to their grandchildren. So it's always been something that has really, really stuck with me. I've done a lot of research myself over the years. And thankfully now, a lot of other big organisations across the UK are doing research into how the church can equip grandparents. There are 14 million grandparents in the UK. And the stereotypical images of grandma and grandpa are long disregarded because now they're usually around the age of 54 and with health improvement and longer life expectancy, they're likely to spend about a third of their lives as a grandparent. And this is worth remembering as we gather this evening to consider the role of grandparents in the life and faith of their grandchildren. In a lot of cases, but not every case we must remember. The relationship between a child and their grandparents can be very special. The family bond combined with the long-term involvement usually leads to a reciprocal relationship which is unique and enjoyable for both parties. But of course, for some, the relationship with grandchildren can be strained or non-existent, and we will spend some time later this evening looking at some of the challenges surrounding this. Increasingly, grandparents are directly involved in childcare, but aside from this, they frequently provide immense emotional support and encouragement for their grandchildren and their parents. The majority strive to be role models, and of those who have a Christian faith, many desire to impart a spiritual legacy and influence within their families. However, even though there seems to be this widespread awareness of the value of Christian grandparents, it seems to be rarely spoken about. And this can leave grandparents feeling undervalued and under-equipped in their role. 
And it's clear that the church has a significant role to champion Christian grandparents in their vital role of passing faith on to their grandchildren. If we can equip and empower grandparents to take an active and intentional role in the spiritual nurture of their grandchildren, we really could see a shift in church culture that could lead to many more young people going on to have an adult faith of their own. You know, we often read about people in the Bible and perhaps study their characters, their stories, their failures, their victories. But it is interesting to note that there are some pretty key Bible characters who are also grandparents. It leads us to think, did they pray for their grandchildren? Did they intentionally look for opportunities to pass on faith to their grandchildren? Abraham and Sarah were Jacob's grandparents. Isaac and Rebecca were Joseph's grandparents. Boaz and Ruth were David's great grandparents. And Lois was Timothy's grandmother. We can certainly look to the Bible for scriptures that encourage faith to be passed down the generations. The most common passage of scripture used for family discipleship is Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9. In verse 6, it says this, These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. As a result, often these words are taken on their own, and this limits the application of the passage to just parents. However, if we look deeper and we read verse 2, it says, So that you your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. It is clear that grandparents are key when it comes to nurturing faith within families. Dr. Sarah Holmes is a lecturer of early childhood studies at Liverpool Hope University, and she carries out research projects connected with children's spirituality, Christian faith formation, the influence of family on young children and holistic well-being. Now, she recently carried out research on Christian grandparents, and she spoke with grandparents all over the UK on Zoom. And her research revealed six main themes, and we're going to look briefly at each one now in order to paint a picture of what it is like for Christian grandparents today. So the first theme that Sarah identified was valued. Grandparents felt they were very valued members of their families, that their grandchildren were precious gifts that they were a real blessing and brought much joy. They spoke generally of strong relationships with their grandchildren, whilst acknowledging, of course, that there were challenges, but that these relationships were special. They kept using words like precious, valued, special, joyful. Research shows that if a child experiences warm relationships that bring security, they are more likely to follow in the footsteps of that person's faith. And this is the case with grandparents too. In these relationships, there's not lots of preaching or theological knowledge really, but genuine, authentic, warm bonds. Isn't it encouraging that these relationships that are valued so much by grandparents are in fact the building blocks for faith formation in children? So number one was valued. The next one is faith. Grandparents spoke about how they were able to share their faith and they often spoke of it in terms of heritage. The phrase they would use is, our family has a faith, not necessarily a statement of an individual, but of a, of a family, a clan, a household. Speaking of generations past, ancestors, something that has been inherited. And they admitted that perhaps they did not sit around the table and read the Bible, 
but they knew that faith was important to the family. It was not always spoken about, but it was simply known. There were stories of surprise that without really being very proactive in talking about their faith, their grandchildren were noticing things about my faith. It was as if the underlying faith was permeating the every day of life and the grandchildren were picking up on this. Grandparents are the link to the family history and they can tell stories of the past and these don't need to be faith stories. These stories anchor a child to their roots, giving them a sense of belonging, identity, a connection to something that's bigger than just themselves. It helps them to relate to who they are and the world around them. And speaking out the truths of the Christian faith, telling stories of God working in their lives, also very important opportunities for children to learn about faith. It says in the Bible that grandparents are to speak of God's goodness to their grandchildren. We read in Psalm 145, verse 4, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. It is good for children to hear about examples of God's faithfulness from someone that is other than their parents or their Sunday school teacher or their youth leaders. Grandparents have the opportunity to make God real by being intentional about telling stories. After all, as we know from Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Values are passed on through listening, supporting and sharing through everyday conversations of life. Our joys, our concerns, weaving God into the midst of our daily lives, sharing our st story of faith naturally in the course of family life. I remember my great grandma had a, a wooden carving above the living room door that said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When I was a little girl and I looked up at this high above my head where I would walk under it, it would feel like I was really passing under it. As I grew up and my great grandma spoke of her life as a missionary in China and Africa, of the times when she needed God to be with her, when my grandma was very sick, when my great grandpa would leave her for weeks on end and go traveling into the bush. Even then, at such a young age, I guess I realized there was something significant about the words that she had chosen to have over that door. That reminder that God would indeed be her strength through those tough years and would continue to be as she became frail and then died in that very house. The significance of having God's word surrounding us so that it is at the forefront of our minds at all times. And then the third theme was guide. Grandparents want to be guides. They want to start their children off on a trajectory of faith. They want to see them know the message of God's love. There was a sense that they wanted to do whatever they could now that would help support them in faith throughout their lives. All children, including grandchildren, will at some, some stage on the journey of life ask those questions, who am I? Who loves me? Who can I trust? Who accepts me? And these are the deep questions that drive at the core of our humanity and ultimately our quest to find faith. And grandparents can have a pivotal role to play because they can answer some of these questions as someone one step removed from a parent and someone with a longer life experience to share. They can guide grandchildren, signpost them, refer to past experiences and champion them as they grow up. And the fourth theme was model. Modeling faith, Sarah found, was not so much about reading Bible stories or praying with grandchildren, but living out a real faith in the everyday interactions with them. 
let's go back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. It says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Modelling faith at mealtimes, in travel time, at bedtime, in the morning time. The biblical pattern is for the truth of the Bible to be transferred through everyday activity. When we're getting ready for bed, eating a meal together, riding in the car, folding the washing together, engaging in late night talks and simply having fun together. I heard of one family who had a granny with faith and one who didn't. And when having a conversation about their grannies one day, they were asked, which granny? And they replied, Jesus, granny. Her faith had identified who she was and the very essence of her being. A significant challenge was raised by many grandparents where there was different religious beliefs, either between the parents and the grandparents or between the grandparents themselves. And whilst this is not, had not necessarily manifested in conflicts or disagreements in the families, the research participants did report that it often created awkwardness and hesitancy about faith activities within the family. Many of these grandparents had not discussed it with their adult children. Some knew their children would not want it, but others had just not had that conversation. And Sarah mentioned that a number of grandparents would say things like, I love having the kids for a sleepover because I can pray with them at bedtime. Moving on to the fifth theme, church. As we mentioned earlier, while there is this awareness of grandparents having an influence in faith formation, many Christian grandparents reported feeling overlooked in their spiritual capacity by the local church. In this research, very few could remember a time when their church had overtly expressed appreciation and facilitation of the part they played in spiritual nurture of their grandchildren. The equipping and the empowerment of this role is not widespread amongst UK churches. Indeed, encouragement and sport tends to occur informally and often simply among grandparents themselves. Whilst they were, they're clearly appreciated and valued within their families, there appears to be this limited recognition and intentional fostering of their spiritual role within the church arena. Grandparents also shared with Sarah that they did not feel able to share with others in church what was happening in their family life. Especially when it came to inevitable family issues, they did not feel able to be open and honest with people in church. <coughs> Excuse me. One grandma indeed said, I would love my church to equip me in how to be a Christian grandparent. And I would be, love to be able to ask my church to pray for me and my grandchildren. Many of the grandparents interviewed strongly expressed feeling ill-equipped and even disempowered within the Christian community. They felt that raising the profile of this group within church would prompt grandparents to be more intentional and proactive in their faith interactions with their grandchildren. And they said they were looking for support, ideas and signposting of things that they could do. And the last theme, help. Sarah spoke to a lot of grandparents who had not had a faith upbringing themselves. And they explained that they had no idea how to pass faith on as they had never experienced that themselves. As we are all well aware, it is not the case that faith has been passed down in all families. And these grandparents were looking for support and help as they are learning on the job, so to speak. Interestingly, one thing they did feel confident in, though, was prayer. 
they absolutely knew they could pray for their grandchildren. And this is a key element in passing on faith. As a result of being new to faith, there were worries about imposing their faith, not wanting to interfere with the child's parenting, not wanting to offend anyone, and thinking that they could not approach topics of faith with their grandchildren. And some grandparents talked about secretly reading a Bible story or secretly praying, pretty sure that their child did not know that they were doing it. So six different themes there, a lot to digest probably, but I think the clear thing that has come from Sarah's research is that the church needs to start having open conversations about this and find ways that we can support new and older Christian grandparents. So what we're gonna do now is go into a couple of breakout rooms um, where I'll just give you an opportunity to have a chat with each other. First of all, if you just want to quickly say who you are and why you decided to come along this evening, that would be great. And then um, a couple of other questions, I'll just pop them in the chat just now for you to be able to see them. Um, there we go. Have you seen any of the themes in the lives of the grandparents you have contact with or in your own life if you are a grandparent? And what help do you think grandparents are looking for as they share faith with their grandchildren? Isabel, I'll let you move people. Welcome back, everybody. That um, eight minutes went incredibly quickly. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry if you didn't quite have enough time for discussion, but there'll be more time to discuss in a, a bit later. Back to you, Jill. So I thought it'd be good now um, to just go through some of the challenges that grandparents could be facing. Um, I know that in my group, there is a mix of people who are grandparents and those who were not. Um, so some of these things will be relevant to you, but um, some will be good for you to understand as you're trying to move things forward in your church. Distance is clearly a key factor, which uh, some pa uh, grandparents find can hinder them. Um, it hinders them being made perhaps more spiritually involved in the lives of their grandchildren. And the majority of those that Sarah interviewed reported that faith conversations were much more difficult over Zoom or telephone than face to face. Um, and this seemed to be because the participants al preferred to allow faith discussions to arise naturally as part of everyday life. And hence, it sometimes could feel very forced and awkward if attempted at the distance. There were um, some examples of success of some families who'd managed to overcome this barrier. She interviewed one grandparent um, who they sort of made a point of having um, a worship time together over Zoom once a month. Um, where they played some music, they said some prayers, and that was actually working for their family. Another grandparent um, talked about how she would send her grandchildren faith-related gifts and letters through the post on a regular basis. And often the idea of having a monthly letter or little parcel to anticipate can be a wonderful thing for a child because they begin to look forward to it. Um, and so that is something that uh, some other grandparents spoke about as well. A few grandparents interestingly uh, reported that actually their grandchildren sometimes wanted the parents to leave the room so that they could have a little Zoom time just themselves um, because it allowed them to speak a little bit more openly without the parents there. So that was a lovely uh, thing to hear. My husband Stan, he grew up in the Middle East as his parents were missionaries and it meant that he only saw his grandparents every one to two years. However, because of contact through letters and then good bonding times when the family were back together in the UK, Stan looks back very positively on his relationship with his grandparents. Everyday contact, although a beautiful thing, is not always possible. 
but a good relationship is possible no matter the distance. There was suggestions of weekly Skype or FaceTime, that visual connection rather than just being on the phone. The idea of that regular thing, oh, grandma always calls me on a Monday when I come in from school. There were stories of um, grandparents recording stories, um, stories about their life, stories about things that had happened in the past and those being digitally sent to grandchildren so they could listen to them before they went to bed at night. And there was lots of talk about planning trips and planning nights over to stay, really taking care to make those special and making sure there was opportunity for good conversation and good bonding time to build those warm connections. Another challenge, of course, is uh, not having a shared faith. If an adult child doesn't share the faith of the parent, it can be very difficult when the grandparent is wanting to pass faith on to the grandchildren. Our UK director, Catherine Hill, shares very wise words. She says this, the vital ingredient is to show our children unconditional love and acceptance while holding in tension our deepest desire for things to be different. Resisting preaching is always a good thing and choosing to love anyway and to keep those relationships alive by our actions means that God knows we keep praying, don't we? And we never know what will happen in time. Family breakdown is another huge challenge. Perhaps Families have broken down through no fault, but it does result in lost contact with grandchildren. I heard the story of Anthony and Maureen, Gramps and Nana to Matthew. They practically raised Matthew till he was about seven years old when his parents separated and they then lost all contact. However, they never missed sending a birthday card or a Christmas present or a card at exam time. They also sent letters as they felt appropriate. 11 years had passed. Not one was ever acknowledged. Then one winter evening at five o'clock, the doorbell rang. As Anthony opened the door, it was as if all the years rolled away. It was Matthew. And he said, hey, Gramps, I got Nana to get my favorite cake in the oven. In some cases, there can be restoration, but of course not in everyone. There will be situations perhaps in our own lives or in the lives of the families that we know in our church where there is estrangement, damage, and people who are carrying hurts. Family life is complex. There are no easy answers and we need to be kind, sensitive, and supportive to all. And we must be praying with and for the grandparents who are in the midst of this, standing alongside them and supporting them in their loss. So what can the church be doing? What can we be doing to create a culture where the role of grandparents is valued and they are empowered to fulfill their role as passers on of faith? Developing intergenerational ministry, where we value bringing all generations to worship together, to meet together, to share life together, can be a real help. I know in our group, there was the mention of Messy Church, that opportunity where old and young can be together and build relationships. How about setting up a grandparents WhatsApp group where they can share with one another, where you can signpost to different resources and support. Just as you may in your church focus on Mothering Sunday or you might have a parent Sunday school session, create a yearly marker for grandparents, whether at a service or a midweek activity. If we put grandparents in our church calendar, it will encourage them that they are valued. Encourage your church leader or minister to speak about grandparenting once a year from the front of church, even through a preach. 
decide to study the passages in the Bible that talk about grandparents and grandchildren, bring about that awareness of the important role that grandparents have around the church. How about an event that grandparents and grandchildren can attend together? Movie night with popcorn in the church hall. Have grandparents share testimony with the rest of church, whether at a service or in a newsletter or at a small group. Raise their profile within your church community. And it is so important that we acknowledge the honorary grandparents in our congregations, those without grandchildren, those without children, but nonetheless, those with spiritual grandchildren. Agnes must have been about 89 when I was a little girl. I would speak to her most weeks at church. She was really lovely. She was very gentle. She always smelled of rose perfume and she always had sweeties. I remember her telling me that she would open up the Glasgow Herald newspaper every morning and go to the birth section. She would close her eyes and let her hand fall and where her finger landed she would pray for that child. She would pray for him or her, for their family, for who they might go on to marry. I tell you, I learned more from Agnes, my spiritual grandma, about prayer than I ever did from my parents or years in Sunday school and youth group. Never underestimate the influence that you can have on your birth grandchildren or your spiritual grandchildren. So time to go back into our groups again. We'll look at a couple more questions. And then when we come back, I think we might have some feedback about what you have discovered in your time together. So maybe we'll go for 12 minutes, Isabel. I think that would be, I think we've got time for that. So I'm just gonna pop the two questions in uh, the chat again. You can try and copy them somewhere so that you've got them once you go. Share about any challenges that you have seen in your own life or the lives of the grandparents you have contact with. And secondly, are there opportunities for you to raise the profile for grandparents within your church community? I'll let you go off to your groups now. Okay, everyone. Hoping that you had some uh, conversations here. Um, would anybody be happy to maybe give a little bit of feedback about what you spoke about in your group? We spoke about not necessarily looking at church being on a Sunday, but about thinking um, of other times of the week that we could connect with children or, or young people um, or anyone um, outside of Sunday morning and, and creating a different environment. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. That was mentioned in our group as well. Just um, that often Sunday morning is the time where families are actually really busy and kids have groups and uh, sport especially. And so just trying to think out the box. Thanks, Joyce. That's great. Yes. Um, a couple of people in our group are doing the kind of growing young course or looking at that those materials with the church and they mentioned that they'd used um, the materials to put together like a list of questions that um, grandparents could ask their grandkids or use as conversation starters with their grandkids and I absolutely love that idea um, it'd be really interesting to see what what came out of that possibly on, on both sides but yeah um I thought that was a really good, like, I mean, I, there was mention of some people hadn't felt comfortable maybe using some of the conversation starters because of um, the lack of shared faith um, within the kind of family dynamic. But, um, yeah, I just thought that was a really nice little tool for potentially opening up conversations. Absolutely. It certainly is. And I think it's just key to remember that, um, when you look at the five key elements that build faith, the first one is that sense of warm relationship. So even if grandparents are, are feeling that they're not getting those 
face conversations, the fact that they are building warm relationships and um, strong bonds, it is so, so important. Um, and that um, almost like that child said, Jesus, granny, it's like through osmosis, they just know that there is something different about their grandparent if they are a person of faith. And um, so it's just reminding grandparents of that, I think, as well. Yeah. In our group, they talked about a couple of other challenges that families face and grandparents face might be children with additional needs and bereavement mm -hmm. and how much to be surrounded by the love, the prayers, the support of the church for the grandparents and that family in that time um, would be valued. Absolutely, absolutely. And on that, um, here for the family, um, we have a befriending support service for families who have children with additional needs. And we also have a support service for those who have lost a child. I'll pop those in for that information in the chat in a moment. So if there's anybody in your um, communities that are looking for support, then um, you could direct them to care for the family for that. One thing that we didn't have time to talk about in, in our group was something, <clears throat> something I'm very aware of is the deep sense of failure that some parents and grandparents carry with them the sense of failure mm. that their own offspring didn't if you like pick up the faith that they tried to teach to them and that as a consequence the grandchildren don't have that faith mm. either um, and I think again that's where the, the concept of some sort of support group nurture group for grandparents would be a very good thing um, I'm always I'm, I'm always very aware when speaking to um, some of my Christian friends um, who have family of similar age that it's a bit of a juggle trying not to be overly enthusiastic about the involvement that my own family have in in things of the faith because I know that some of them are hurting very deeply that theirs have not got that so I think that's another aspect that we do need to be very much aware of. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And just then um, having real sensitivity when we are um, when we're dealing with families. And that's the case in all of church life, isn't it? We have to remember that every sit every situation is different. And every situation, no matter how it may look on the outside, will be having struggles and will be having real difficult times. Um, and yeah, I think that that sense of failure is a really, really big thing. Um, but one thing that's come out of the research that we've done, um, which shows that obviously faith formation so often happens within the home, doesn't just happen in the home, it happens through the community. Um, and so, um, you know, it's almost saying it's all of our responsibility for any young person that we are coming into contact with. Um, it is not just on the parent, it is not just on the grandparent and that we can do it together. Um, and that can be a really encouraging thing for people who are struggling with that sense of failure or, or not having got it just right. Anyone else? I think I think too. It's important to be judgmental uh, towards young people because um, life nowadays is perhaps very very different to what we were in our twenties or in our teens, etc. So if if we are open in our discussions, inter in interested in what being a young person is like. Uh, that, that could open up a number of areas where uh, we, we, we can start to say, right, what, what do we need to do? Because the church, the church, I completely agree with you, the church is not Sunday at 10 o'clock. And, and if, if you've never been to church before, and the first day you go at 10 o'clock on Sunday, you say, wait a minute, what's this all about? But what we've got as older folk, older Christian folk, is the opportunity to, to actually communicate, think about, talk about, talk to, 
our younger folk really understand, which is quite tricky sometimes, understand what life is like. And because communication, everybody seems to have a smartphone. I don't have one just now, but the communication takes place. Everybody's talking all the time. Is there an opportunity there for us? And I know the Church of Scotland has got a, a, a sort of focus on that as we go forward. It's not something I've got an expertise in. There's all sorts of different elements in being a young person these days. And I think that if, if we take care to listen carefully to them and say, right, OK, this is what could happen once a month on a Wednesday. It could be music, it could be this. All, there's a dozen things, hundred things perhaps that you could do. And it's a question really that we've got to consider what's going to be the best in our community and the families that we know and the families that we can communicate with locally and see where we go from here. So it's, it, I, I think I, I, I never get depressed. I, I think it's easy to say, oh, dear, dear, the old Church of Scotland used to have a million, there's now 300,000. That's a tremendous number of people. And I think we've got to be positive about the future and, and, and do little things, tiny little things as we go through. And I'm quite sure that that will start to develop. You know, we've, we've got a new youth worker who's already started to do things. Uh, in the schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these things are positive, and we can share them with other congregations. Because I think part of the problem has been you're in a congregation, I mean, last way draws well, and, you know, you've been there, and that's it. The Church of Scotland has got all sorts of, you know, buildings and borders. There's dozens of ideas that we can have on the table to see where we're going. So we're not alone as we march forward. Gordon, thank you so much for sharing that. What an encouragement that is. Um, yeah, absolutely. And interesting, you mentioned the smartphone and communication that happens through smartphones, but children actually crave face-to-face -face conversation. And so the fact that you don't have a smartphone, Gordon, is actually a really good thing because that means maybe you can have that face-to-face -face conversation with that young person. Um, so it's no bad thing at all, no bad thing at all. Thank you, Gordon, that was wonderful. So um, I thought uh, just to finish off, I would just um, give some practical ideas that I have sort of come across um, that can help grandparents um, in their role as being the passers on of faith. And it comes um, in four sections. And the first one is family traditions. If we can create family traditions that have a faith element, they can be really, really powerful. I had friends who had a lovely ritual on Christmas morning. They had the privilege of having their grandchildren with them every year. And the grandma used to take the baby Jesus from the nativity scene and she would hide it somewhere in the room. And then as the kids got older, somewhere in the house. And the grandchildren had to find him and place him back in the manger before anyone opened any presents. And that simple act, it just placed Christ at the center of a day that maybe otherwise might have got lost in the excitement. Traditions that build memories and warmth in relations, relationships that convey values, they can stay in a child's memory right into adulthood. If you can get to the stage where you say with your grandchildren, we always, then you know you've created a tradition that will stay in their minds right into their adulthood. The next one is family service. Research shows that when families serve together, they grow in faith. It creates bonds, it builds that warm relationship. Again, we mentioned a few times, but it also shows grandchildren faith in action. And there are countless creative ways families can serve together. Perhaps cook a meal with them and take it to someone who's just had a new baby or an isolated elderly person. Take the children shopping, buy some food and then deliver it to a food bank. 
perhaps if you live far away, you could do the thing where you gather things to put in a shoe box and give to one of those charities who provide gifts for kids who would otherwise go without. That's the kind of thing that you could do online together, um, buying things or throughout the year, give them some money that they have to go and buy something. And then that opportunity you get in the run up to Christmas to be with them, pack all the things together and go and deliver that box to the centre that is organising it. There are loads of different ways that serving means that it grows faith. Family meals. Families that eat together, research shows, have better connections, the relationships are warmer, and we know that it can result in better outcomes for that family. And so there is opportunity in eating together, whether you're in the situation you can do that regularly or whether that's just once or twice a year. There is something about eating together. It's what Jesus spent his life doing, isn't it? He gathered with people and ate with them. So the visit to grandma and papa's for Sunday lunch could end up being a really important time for a child to just even say a prayer together. I heard of one family, they used to have the prayer chair at the table and whoever sat in that chair got to say grace. Simple things that can build faith. And family prayer. Grandparents can make prayer fun and creative. What about red light prayers? Saying a prayer every time you stop at a red light when they're in the car with you could be for people who are lonely. I know that we, if we ever hear an ambulance, we immediately pray for the person who is in the ambulance and pray for the men and women who are going to be looking after that person when they get to hospital. Balloon prayers are a lovely one. You write a prayer on a little piece of paper and place it inside a balloon. Go to the local park or along your street, blow the balloon up together and let it go. And it's as if you're setting off that prayer for God. Christmas card prayers. I love this one. Every year we keep all of the Christmas cards that we've had. And every now and again, we pull the box out we pick a card and we pray for that person. That's an amazingly easy and creative thing that you could do, even if your child lives, your grandchild lives on the other side of the world. So there are loads of resources out there. I know that somebody mentioned the growing young and that idea of almost having those conversation starters, lots of different things. And on our website, there is lots that you can look at. Um, I'm just going to put some information just now in the chat for you. And then I will go through. And I will send these to you in a follow-up email as well. Thank you. That's brilliant, Isabel. Um, so first thing to mention is we have this top tips leaflet. We have a whole range of leaflets that are available to either download for free and you can print them yourselves or they're available for 15 pence each. This is a lovely one. You could um, pop it in a little gift pack if you're doing something for families or whatever. Some really lovely, helpful hints and tips on how to do grandparenting well. Um, and then we've got three books that I would really recommend. Um, there's this one called We Always. We talked about that idea of traditions. Well, this has been written by Rob, our Rob Parsons, our founder, and his wife, Diane. Loads of ideas there that you could take for grandparents. We have this one here, the really, the little book for really, really brilliant grandparents, written by two grandparents. Rob Parsons has five grandchildren, as does Catherine Hill. I bought this for my parents and my in-laws at Christmas there, and they've said it is a really good read. And then the book that I read from earlier, Rob Parsons' book, the 60 Minute Grandparent, Becoming the Best Grandparent You Can Be. He guarantees that you can read it in 60 minutes. Not sure, depending on the speed of your reading, um, but it is a fantastic book. I would highly recommend that. And then we have uh, the Kitchen Table Project. I've popped the um, website there. 
So when we did research about six or seven years ago into why there were so few children in church, that resulted in some research that's really been critical in changing the way we look at faith formation. The idea that faith formation starts in the home and is supported by the local church. There is loads of information, resources. If you're thinking about trying something intergenerational, we have a range of resources called, let me get this right, the Big Scrumptious Faith-Filled Feast. And we now have six different ones. We've just created one for the coronation. It's an opportunity to have an intergenerational gathering that usually goes around food. You can be really posh and make food for people, or you can get people to bring their sandwiches with them. And it's all about mixing all the generations together and looking at the promises of God. I've also put my email address right at the end there. I am here to support you. Care for the Family exists to support family life in the UK. And we obviously support people who are uh, struggling with bereavement, children with additional needs. We look after those who are parenting on their own. But my role is to look after people who are really on the front line of working with families. So if I can be of a help to your church or to you as an individual, please do not hesitate to get in touch. It would be lovely to chat with you. So as we just come to the end of our time together, um, I thought I'd give you some reminders that you can either give to the grandparents that you're working with or a support for you reminding you if you are a grandparent. Grandchildren often see grandparents as an emotional safety net, a bridge over troubled waters when life throws them challenges. Often in the teenage years, young people turn to grandparents for advice and guidance. And as the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 6, children's children are a crown to the aged. May we all be a part of the journey that will see our churches equip and support grandparents in their most important ministry of passing faith on to their grandchildren. So we'll maybe just have a few minutes for questions, but I thought first, maybe people could just pop in the chat. What is the one thing that you are going to take away from this evening? What's been that light bulb moment for you? What's been that thing that you're going to try? What's that thing that's been an encouragement? Um, write in the chat so that we can all share some of the learning from this evening. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that now. But please do that. Thank you so much, Jill. I think you've given such clear principles but just a reminder, it's not about getting our grandchildren to be in church. What we've been talking about is how can we get church to support us as grandparents and other grandparents to be confident and effective in living and nurturing those faith journeys with our grandchildren. So I think that's a really important distinction because so often we just think, oh, we just need to get them to come to church. But that's not what it's about. It's about the growing and the nurturing of faith. So do let's have a little look at the chat now. If you could all open the chat, let's have to see what's in there. And um, Jill, maybe you could read those things out yes, and um, summarize so it. Joyce has shared just as you said there, Isabel, church is not necessarily on Sundays. And Anne has shared that it's a big encouragement to gather grandparents together like this to share each other's experience. Yes, the, I think um, any group that is feeling disempowered or feeling unsupported, if we can give them a voice, if we can just gather them together on Zoom, perhaps like this, or maybe face to face over a coffee, it just gives people such encouragement to be able to know it's not just them. They're not on their own. 
Um, Lynn Shared Church should be intergenerational. Absolutely. I am a big supporter of that. Uh, Sheila uh, is saying ditto, Anne, about the encouragement uh, to gather grandparents together. Marion loved the idea of Christmas card prayers and balloon prayers and noting that we always means it's a tradition that will last Jess has shared that to make churches aware of the ministry to grandparents, helping them to support them and equip them. Yes, we talk about family ministry. We talk about children's ministry, don't we? We talk about maybe ministry to the elderly. We need to be talking about the fact that grandparents have a ministry that is key in them passing on faith. And Isabel has shared the power of prayer and strong relationships. Amazing. Thank you everyone for sharing those. Could I just share one lovely idea that Go I think Gordon, it was you that mentioned it, that when his grandchildren were transitioning from primary school to secondary, he sent them one of those scripture union books or some special prayer things. And he as a grandparent is aware of Bible study things for children. So he sends those to his grandchildren. So there's, you know, I think if grandparents can be aware of what faith resources there are that they can send to their grandchildren, use with their grandchildren, try some of these kind of creative praying things with your grandchildren. I think we maybe need to do, be a little bit better about sharing what there is that yes. children of different ages might really benefit from and enjoy. That's right. And I mean, that was one of the big things that came out from Sarah's research was we need signposting, we need information, we need ideas. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, Sandy's just shared that some, some grandparents send children to SU camps. Absolutely amazing. Um, okay. I know certainly it's a, they have a huge impact on young people's faith. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's coming to nine o'clock. Um, so that's wonderful just to get those ideas and um, to think about how we can encourage and nurture our grandparents to uh, be effective in sharing faith um, and strong bonds and relationships with grandchildren. Jill, thank you so much for um, for all that you've shared and all these key principles. I think there's a lot for us to think about in our own relationships and our own families, but also maybe some of the things that we can go and talk to our congregations and to guild groups about what we can do more to support other people in their grandparently roles, whether that's uh, direct grandparents or um, additional grandparents, spiritual grandparents how we can be effective in that and with that kind of purpose of just living and living our faith and sharing our faith in very easy natural ways. So Jill I wonder whether you could just pray for us and pray for our grandparently roles and also the church to kind of take this more seriously and create those opportunities. Lord God, thank you that we can read in scripture about the importance of family faith. I thank you that you created family with generations that will live at the same time. I thank you for the role that grandparents have in passing faith on to their grandchildren. I pray for every single person here this evening. Pray for those who are grandparents. For those who are spiritual grandparents, for those who are wanting to support the grandparents in their church community. I pray that we will have been stirred this evening to make a difference, whether that's in our own grandparenting life or whether it is to encourage grandparents that we know. I pray now that you would give us a good end to the day that we would think of you, Lord Jesus, as we close our eyes this evening and that you would bless us all with a good sleep. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you once again, Jill. Um, we'll send you a follow-up email with all those different links and resources. 
do have further conversations with other grandparents <laughs> and with your churches about what other ways that we can do some of this. And um, if you've got any suggestions for other webinars that you'd like us to explore, please uh, do just drop me an email.